Lord of Lords, King of Kings, you alone are worthy of all our praise. Just fix your eyes on him. Just lift your head to him, lift your hands to him, lift your hearts to him. And just tell him he's worthy. Just tell him you alone are worthy. You alone are worthy, Lord, of my adoration, of my heart's adoration, of all my love and all my thanks. You alone, Jesus, are King, King of my life, King of my life. King of kings and King, Lord of lords, Jesus, the one who is, the one who was, the one who is to come. All glory, all glory, all glory, all glory to you, all glory to you, all glory to you, you, Lord Jesus. All glory to you. All glory to him who loves us. All glory to him who loves us. And has freed us from our sins. Jesus. It's freed us from our sins. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. By shedding your blood for us, you have made us a kingdom of priests for our God, your Father, our Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We will never stop thanking you, Lord Jesus, for who you are and what you have done for us. We will never stop thanking you. All glory to you. You have loved us and loves us us and freed us from our sins by shedding his blood. We are the kingdom of priests for our God, our Father. Thank you, Lord. And he says, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to us. Grace and peace to you from the one who is who always was and who is still to come from the spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end says the Lord God, I am the one who is, who was, is still to come, the almighty, the almighty one. Jesus, you are wonderful. You are our king. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. I love that this scripture in Revelation says he loves us and he loved us. And you know, we can tell him back, Lord, I love you. Can you say it to him? (laughs) I love you. You love me and I love you. And this is where our peace is. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You can take a seat. Um, We're just going to carry on reading some words from uh, uh, Revelation and some other scriptures today. I just, it's just so wonderful that 
you know, as a church, we've been looking at recently who Christ is in us and who we are in him. And it's just so wonderful to get these truths in us that, that are our security, knowing who he is, knowing who we are. He is the victorious king, amen? amen. And his victory is in you. His victory is in every single one of us if, we, if he is our Lord and Saviour, amen? amen? The victory is ours. His victory, his overcoming, his life, his power, his peace, his love, it's in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's just so wonderful to be hearing this, learning this together and individually. But as a body, really uh, coming to terms with who he is. And it's interesting when Jesus revealed in the book of Revelation himself to John, his disciple, his beloved, um, he said, I'm the one who is. And this is what we've been looking at in depth the last few weeks and always need to know who he is for us and in us, yeah? Amen. But he also says and wanted to reveal who he was and who he is to come. Who he was is really important for us as believers. Yeah. Not just to know who he is to us now as the risen Jesus and our Lord and our Saviour and our Messiah, but he's become our king, but he's always been king. Right. He's always been a king of a people, and he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. And we're nearer his coming than his second coming than when he came in the first place. Yeah? And that's partly why when this book was written, Revelation, it was said that it, but people have to read this. We need to know. We need to know what's coming. And we know, need to know who's coming. And yes, we know him as our Lord and Saviour and as our, our King, but there's something so much greater going on that we are a part of. Amen? And um, so we're going to look at, uh, we've been looking at who he is to us, and we will always look at that as a church from the word of God, amen, um, who he is in us. Um, but we want to look at who he was as well and who he is to come. Because the days that we are in, it's so important that as the church of Jesus Christ, we know, <laughs> amen. So when we look at the one who, um, who was, then we obviously need to look in scripture because that's how we know who he was. And we're going to look through quite a few scriptures today. And um, unfortunately, the scriptures didn't make it onto the screen. So you need to pin your ears back. Ready? Get your Bibles out, your notepads, your books, because I'm going to be sharing scriptures with you that are so important that the body of Christ, the church, know who our God is and was and who's coming. Okay? <laughs> um, and if you find yourself snoozing because you've been listening too long, just wake yourself up and say, this is important, I know this. Yeah? <laughs> or nudge the person next to you if they're dropping off and say, this is important, we need to know this. So we're going to look at, um, we're going to fly through the Bible. Numbers 23 and 24. And if you're not looking at it now yourself, just jot these references down so that you are... Um, you've got them to hand. God chose a people to reveal himself to and reveal, reveal himself through to the nations of the earth. And that people started with a man called Abraham who had a son called Isaac and then a son called Jacob. And the generations and tribes that came from that family, when Jacob renamed, God named, renamed Jacob Israel, that's where the name came from, uh, God chose that nation, that group of people, to be witnesses of who God was, to live as his priests in the earth. He's, he called them his treasured possession. And Moses was leading the people of God out of slavery where they'd been in Egypt into the land that he was promising them. Okay, you with me so far? Yes. You're awake? Okay, so in num the book of Numbers, right early on in Scripture, Numbers 23 and 24... Well, in 22, there is a king who sees the Israelites camped out in his land because God's leading them to the promised land. And this king looks on Israel and hates them. And he wants them killed and he wants them cursed. So he calls on a medium who doesn't believe in God to speak over the people of Israel and to curse them. 
So he says to this, uh, the, uh, the, this king says to this medium, uh, there's a vast crowd of people in the earth threatening me. Come and curse them for me um, because they are too powerful for me and then maybe I'll be able to conquer them and drive them out. So I want you to come and curse them. And this medium says to this king, um, or God says to the medium, you can go with them, but you are not to curse them because they are a blessed people. Amen. Okay? So in uh, Numbers 23, this medium speaks and he says, uh, Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come and announce Israel's doom. But how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I condemn those whom the Lord has not condemned? I see them from the clifftops. I watch them from the hills. I see a people who live by themselves, set apart from other nations. Who can count Jacob's descendants as numerous as dust? Who can count even a fourth of Israel's people? Let me die like the righteous. Let my life end like theirs. And Balak the king demanded, what have you done? I brought you to curse my enemies. Instead, you have blessed them. And Balaam said, I will only speak the message the Lord puts in my mouth. So it carries on. The king takes him to another point to look over the people and curse them. Rise up, Balak, and listen, says Balaam. This is what he says. God is not a man, so he does not lie. So often as Christians, we take verses for ourselves. But he was speaking them over, and it, we, can take, we can do that. But he was speaking them in context to the people of Israel. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Listen, I received a command to bless. God has blessed and I cannot reverse it. No misfortune is in his plan for Jacob. No trouble is in store for Israel. For the Lord their God is with them. He has been proclaimed their king. That's right. This is important because this is who the Jesus that we worship, our king, he's their king. It says he's been proclaimed their king and some verses, uh, some transla translations say the shout of the king is in their midst. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have the shout of the king in you? Yes. Yes. Do you have the shout of the king over your life? Yeah. The shout of the king is with them. God brought them out of Egypt. Did he bring you out of slavery? Yes. For them he is strong as a wild ox. No curse can touch Jacob. No magic has any power against Israel. This is true of God's people. Right. So this is true of us. Yes. No magic, no witchcraft, no curse has any power against a believer. Amen. We need to know this, right? And this is where it comes from. <laughs> um, and it will be said of Jacob, what wonders God has done for Israel. Has he done wonders for your, in your life? Amen. Come on. These people, this is Israel, rise up like a lioness, like a majestic lion rousing itself. They refuse to rest until they have feasted on prey, drinking the blood of the slaughtered. Sounds a bit intense, doesn't it? So again, the king flies into a rage. What earth have you done? I've called you to curse them, not bless them. And it carries on. We just finished with this. Numbers 24. By now, Balaam, the medium, realised that the Lord was determined to bless Israel. So he did not resort to divination. Instead, he turned and looked out towards the wilderness where he saw the people of Israel camped tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him and this is the message he delivered. This is the message of Balaam, the message of the man whose eyes see clearly. The message of one who hears the words of God, who sees a vision from the Almighty or bows down with eyes wide open. How beautiful are your tents, O Jacob. How lovely are your homes, O Israel. They spread before me like palm groves, like gardens by the riverside. They are like tall trees planted by the Lord. Like cedars beside the waters, waters will flow from their buckets. Their offspring will have all they need. Their king will be greater than Agag. Their kingdom will be exalted. God brought them out of Egypt. For them he is strong as a wild ox. He devours all the nations that oppose him. It's interesting that God considers nations that oppose Israel as opposing him. 
He breaks their bones in pieces, shooting them with arrows. Like a lion, Israel crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to arouse her? Blessed is everyone who blesses you, O Israel, and cursed is everyone who curses you. Okay, so to finish off these few verses, in Numbers 24, Balaam prophesies again. The message of the man whose eyes see clearly, the message of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High. It's, in, it's interesting, isn't it, how this medium was, was using divination. Now he's just seeing it. He's just seeing God. He's seeing God's people. He's seeing these blessings before his eyes. He's just, he's just overflowing. And knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who bows down with eyes wide open. I see him. But not here and now, but I perceive him far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter, a ruler will emerge from Israel. It will crush the heads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheth. Eden will be taken over and Seir, its enemy, will be conquered. While Israel marches on in triumph, a ruler will rise in Jacob. He was their king, determined to bless them. If he hadn't, and he'd allowed the king to annihilate them, the Messiah would never have come, the the one in the far distant future, because he was born from these people, yeah? We know that. Jesus was a Jew. If God had allowed them to, to come under the enemy's plan, they wouldn't have, the Messiah wouldn't have come and we wouldn't be sitting in this room today. (laughs) That's why God protected his people. Not because they were brilliant, not because they were always good, because they were just like us. But God had a plan. He was preparing the way for the king to come. The king that would be king of all nations and of us today. Amen? Amen. It's why it's important to read the word, yeah? yeah? But as a people, they rejected him as king. So God did all this for them. But as they're moving through the nations, as they're coming to the promised land, they reject him as king and they look at all the other nations around them and they want a human king. They don't want king to, uh, God to look after them anymore. We want a human king. So God agrees and he says to Saul, who's the prophet, he said to them, um, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, they have rejected me from being king over them. So we see them as a people, uh, now with human kings, some good, some bad. We know that King David was the king, the greatest king that Israel ever had. And he, but he always knew his place. He was the greatest king Israel ever had, but he knew God was king. Amen. Okay. Amen. So in Psalm 99, we know David wrote you know, most of the Psalms, and it says, the Lord is king. This is what David said. Let the nations tremble. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. The Lord sits in majesty in Jerusalem, exalted above all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Your name is holy. Mighty king, lover of justice, you have established fairness. You have acted with justice and righteousness throughout the land, throughout Israel. Exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Amen. So as far as King David was concerned, God was still king over Israel. Amen. And as far as God was concerned, he didn't stop being their king, even though they had rejected him. God said... I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. He knew he needed to keep looking after them, right? (laughs) Because they were going to mess up. He never rejected them and he never cursed them. Isaiah 44, 6. And this is quoted in Revelation 1. For the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts says this. I'm the first, I'm the last, and there is no God beside me. And it says there, in case you missed it, for the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer. And this is our, this is our King. But the true, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal King, Jeremiah said. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you, it says in Zephaniah. 
And in Zechariah, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. Amen. Amen. Right, let's move on. So in Jeremiah, we're going to read uh, read this, Jeremiah 23. So all the prophets were proclaiming, uh, Jeremiah was a prophet, that the prophets foretold Jesus would come as a baby, he would come Bethlehem, he would come as a ruler, and many of the prophets also foretold this second coming of uh, Jesus where he would... um, where he would rule and reign. And in Jeremiah 23, let's have a look there. Uh, you okay so far? Yeah. Yeah. Making sense? Uh, Jeremiah 23, uh, verse 5. The time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. Okay, so King David was the greatest king. From his family, the righteous king of all would come. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land, and this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness, and in that day Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. Uh, Jeremiah 33. He repeats the same bit that we've just heard. And he goes on to say, David will have a descendant, Jeremiah 33, verse 17. David will have a descendant sitting on the throne of Israel forever. Verse 20, this is what the Lord says, If you can break my covenant with the day and the night, so that one does not follow the other, only then will be my covenant with my, Dave, with my servant David be broken. Uh, And you can go on and carry on. Verse 23, have you noticed that people are saying the Lord chose Judah and Israel and then abandoned them? They are sneering and saying that Israel is not worthy to be counted as a nation. And this has been spoken since Israel's formation. It's the same language that we hear today, yeah? They're not worthy to be counted as a nation. But this is what the Lord says, I would no more reject my people than I would change my laws that govern night and day, earth and sky. I will never abandon the descendants of Jacob or David, my servant. This is who our God is. He's the Lord who created the heavens and earth, and the heavens and earth will not end until he says so, and his plan is still unrolling. And this is the king that we worship. So all the prophets foretold of Jesus coming as a baby, like I said, and and all the prophets... And you can read them, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, the minor prophets, which are loads of them before the New Testament. Many of them speak of the coming of the king to Israel and to the nations. So that's all in the Old Testament. Between the Old Testament and those prophets speaking all that, there are 400 years of silence. And then all of a sudden, what do we see in the sky? In the New Testament, what do we see in the sky? We see a star in Matthew 2. The star that prophesied, that had been spoken of way back in the beginning in Numbers, the star that is prophesied is seen by the wise men or the kings, whatever you want to, they were wise men, they were astrologers, they were kings of the East. They saw the star that was prophesying the king being born. And they came to Jerusalem and they said to the king then, King Herod, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And if you read it, he just throws him into a panic. (laughs) And he says to all his his guys, where does it say? Where does it say the the Messiah is going to be this king? Where does it say? So they pick up their scriptures and they say, He's going to be born in Bethlehem. So they knew, they knew he was coming and they knew he was going to be coming in Bethlehem. So um, he was born king of the Jews. Scripture is quite clear. So throughout his, uh, Jesus' time on the earth, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God. He's showing his disciples how to be, how to live, how to forgive, how to move out in authority and power. And he's releasing the kingdom of God on earth through his believers. Amen. Amen. 
But on the whole, the people of Israel didn't recognize him as their king. Some did, and as he's going, you know, to Jerusalem, towards the, the, he's going to be crucified, the, some of the people are declaring, this is our king, the king is coming, the king is here. But many didn't believe in him. Again, they didn't want this king. So they arrested him, had him arrested, had him put on trial. And, and Pilate says to him, in Mark 15 too, it says, Pontius Pilate says to him, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, it is as you say. And he started to talk about his kingdom. Before he went to the cross, Jesus looked over Jerusalem and he wept. And he said, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers how often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now look, your house is abandoned and desolate. For I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay? So that still stands. That blessing him, that proclaiming him king, that welcoming him, that worshipping him, that adoring him, that exaltation of who he is that we do, when they recognise and want him as king and call on him in that way and worship him, he's coming back. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because he's still their king. So he died with the sign on the cross over his head. This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And in Romans we read, don't we? Did God reject them because they rejected him? Romans 9, 10, and 11. Of course not. Of course not. He could never reject them. Let's look there. I know some of you have heard this over and over. But some of you here are new to the church. Or maybe you've not read this before. And, a, and actually hearing for the first time who this king is that we worship. Who he was and who he is to come. Romans 9, 10 and 11 talks of God's heart for the Jewish people. That even though they rejected their Messiah, he had not rejected them. Because he's faithful, amen? If he's faithful to us, he's faithful to them. That's where his faithfulness comes from. Um, there's so much in Romans 11, and we've looked through this before in the part, we're not going to look at all of it, but there's a few, you know, I asked then, Paul says, who was a Jew, has God rejected his own people, the nation of Israel? Of course not. I myself am an Israelite. They're trying to get right through the law, through their way, through Judaism, and they missed the Messiah. But he says, 11, 11, God's people, did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. They were disobedient to God. Uh, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles. So they rejected the gospel and the gospel came around the nations to us. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> I'm very thankful for that. Um, the gospel has come around the, nation, come around the Gentiles to the nations but he wants his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Yeah. He doesn't want Israel wiped off the map. No, that's right. From the river to the sea, that's not God's plan. Yeah. Yeah. And as believers, we need to know this yeah. because this is, this is the word of God. Yeah. He's never rejected them. He wants them to become jealous of the love that we have for him. Yeah. Yeah of the praise and adoration that is in our heart for their Messiah and their King. And we make them jealous through love. How we reach every person with the gospel through love. He has not rejected them, so we do not reject them. Amen? Amen. Do you get it? Are you getting it? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, we're not all there. We're learning all the time. We're learning all the time. When the Lord said to me, I was, I was praying the other day and um, I was, yeah, just spending time with the Lord. And he, and he just said to me, just said this line, which set me on this whole course of this today. He said to me, when I became your king, because I love him, right? <laughs> you might guess. <laughs> when I became your king, did I stop being king of the Jews? And he just asked me, 
It's like, of course not. So he's king. He's revealing who he is. We're praying into this awakening in the nations, the awakening in the church to who he is. How amazing, majestic, holy, powerful in our lives, but for our neighbours, for the nation, for people to come out of Halloween, for people to come out of death, for people to recognise who he is over Christmas. I mean, really basic stuff, right? That's our king. He's still king for them. And one day they're going to receive him as king. And this journey that we're on, the timing that we're in now, is so important. Because we're close, like I said, we're closer to his second coming than his first, right? And we look forward to Christmas. Christmas is coming. I love Christmas. And um, I want people to know how amazing he is. Actually, that's why I wrote this. (laughs) Uh, He reigns. And this was written for, to, uh, it's a 21-day devotional on who he is, what he came to do as their Messiah, but, but what he has done in our lives. Okay. So I wrote this as a devotional to be done during the 21 days leading up to Christmas, which is Advent, because it is on, is based on Isaiah 9, on the coming of the King. Yeah. So if you haven't got this, we got some, we've got some in there on sale today. It's a devotional that you can do every day. We just spend time reading the word, spend time with Jesus and allow him to just work in you who he is and what he's done for you in your life. Amen. Amen. But it's, it's in Advent, it's in preparation, Advent, the coming of the king. But because if we're nearer the second coming than his first coming, it's not just Christmas we look forward to, but it's his return. Amen. And we're in those days, those last days. Revelation is about the last days. And another two plugs before I finish. If any of you like watching Louis Giglio, anybody heard of Louis Giglio? On YouTube. Uh, Leads a church in the States. He's done an amazing 16-week teaching on the book of Revelation. And it is just all eyes on Jesus. It is brilliant. All eyes on Jesus. Because this is our king and he's coming soon. And as a church, we need to know. The world needs to know. The nations need to know. He's coming. So if if you're interested in watching Louis Giglio, just Google Google his series on Revelation or whatever. And it's it's really, really good. And it is really, really, wow, Jesus, this is who you are and you're coming. I might not understand it all, but I want to be ready. Amen. And some guys in the church, David Greaves and Andy Barker, have put a course together. Um, and that's on YouTube. It's called the ca- they're called the Cabin. Is that right? Cabin Ministries. Cabin Ministries. Again, these guys have done a whole uh, work on presentation on the book of Revelation. And, um, and you can talk to him about that. You can, they, they need a group that goes through that. They've just started another one, but they'll be carrying on, I'm sure. Because and more, and more, talk, more people are talking and reading the book of Revelation because it's so... It's soon. <laughs> I won't say anything more than that. Okay, so the one who is to come that we were reading about in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, and I'm not going to read Revelation today obviously Uh, but it does say that blessed are the people who read these words this prophecy to the church and he blesses all who listen to this message and who obey what it says for the time is near and this was 2,000 years ago so we're nearer now to his coming amen the king who's coming the king of kings and the lord of lords so Jesus was crucified resurrected and was seated at the right hand of the Father, awaiting the time where he would come back for his people and come back uh, for the nations. He's coming to rule and he's coming to reign. Amen. When John the Baptist proclaimed the coming of Jesus, it was repent for the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, get ready, get your hearts ready. Jesus is coming. You know, as a church, we can be saying the same thing. We need to get our hearts ready because he's coming. Okay, I don't know when. I'm not saying he's coming next week or something. There's still stuff to happen in the earth and in the nations and in Israel before he comes. But we're getting ready, our hearts ready, our lives ready, getting our friends and neighbours ready. Do you know this king is coming? But next time it won't be to get our 
He won't be coming to teach to get our hearts right. He'll be coming to judge every one of us. Amen. He'll be coming to rule and reign. And it says he comes to judge the nations. That's, it. Amen. That's where he's coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords to rule and reign in the earth and bring his kingdom. Amen. Amen. I want to be ready. <laughs> he makes us ready. His blood has covered us. We are cleansed. We are clothed in white as far as scripture is concerned. We are ready. But at the same time, we want to live ready and get others ready. This is not just about me, myself, I, amen. He comes to rule the nations. He comes to judge individuals and he comes to judge nations. And this is important that we know this as believers because none of us wants anybody harmed. We want individuals to come to the Lord, amen. Amen. But God just doesn't deal in, in, the, in the end times. He doesn't just deal with individuals. He deals with nations. Yes. The scripture is very clear. He would deal with the demons and he would deal with the devil. And he would establish a reign, a new heaven and a new earth that okay. we will be in. Yeah? You still with me? Yes. So the prophets, like I said, in the Old Testament prophesied his coming the first time and the second time. And I want to take us through some of those scriptures. And some of those scriptures are the same as the, the, the words in Revelation. Okay, and we're, we're going to see that. The Old Testament prophets, prof, prophets were prophesying to the nation of Israel that Jesus was, the Messiah would come and rule. God would come, their king would come. That's how they put it. Let me find just Joel. Hang on, here it is. Joel chapter 3. Um... When I restore, this is God, and the chapter of this is the judgment against enemy nations. When I restore the prosperity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather the armies of the world into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and there I will judge them for harming my people, my special possession, for scattering my people among the nations, and for dividing up my land. Did you hear that? He judges the nations of how they treat Israel. And it says, the word's very clear, God brings the nations against Israel. He brings them against Jerusalem. He causes this stuff to happen because there is a timing in his plan of when he will cause them to come against Jerusalem. The inhabitants of Jerusalem will cry out to him and he will come and he will deliver them from their enemy nations. And this is hard because we look at what's going on in the land of Israel and we hate what's going on. For anybody that's killed, anybody that's destroyed. But when a nation, you know when we read the Old Testament and we take it for ourselves, yeah, God, you deliver us from our enemies. Yeah, God, you deliver me from my enemies. But this is what it looks like in reality. On the ground, feet in boots, and the, old, the, the Re- book of Revelation is very clear. God delivers us from the devil and demons, but he also delivers from armies that are in the earth Amen. Amen. who are fighting against God. That's right. That's right. This is why we need to know what the word says in the times that we are in. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. And I want you to know the word. I don't want it to come across that I'm banging a drum just sh- I'm not a shofar blowing, flag waving, I love Israel, they're wonderful. This is the word of God and I hear so much in, 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 in church, in, in Christianity where I, not necessarily here, but in other places and on the news that is so against God. Yeah. It's anti-God, yeah. even in the church. Yeah. We can only pray what the word says. Yes. We can't pray against God's plans. That's right. That's why we need to know. I hope that comes across in the right way. So in Joel again, um, he calls the nations to war. Chapter 3, you can read it yourself. Say to the nations far and wide, get ready for war. Let the nations be called to arms. Call out your warriors. Let them march to the valley of Jehoshaphat and there I, the Lord, will sit to pronounce judgment on them all. Swing the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come tread the grapes of the winepress that's full 
and the storage vats are overflowing with the wickedness of these people. Thousands upon thousands are waiting in the valley of decision. And there the day of the Lord will soon arrive. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will no longer shine. The Lord's voice will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth will shake. But the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a strong fortress for the people of Israel. Then you will know that I, the Lord, your God, live in Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy forever and foreign armies will never again conquer her. Um, Psalm 2, I know many of us know this, but it's this, these are the days that we're in. There are unholy alliances going on in nations against God. Why do the nations so, why are the nations so angry or why do they rage? Why do, the, why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. In anger, he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain. The king proclaims the Lord's decrees. This is, this is Jesus. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. You will break them with, with an iron rod and smash, smash them like clay pots. Now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. This is why it's so important that we pray, that we pray for the nations, that we pray for leaders that they would turn to God and not against God. Amen. Amen. It's, that's Jesus' heart for the nations. Yeah. Uh, now then, you kings, act wisely. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son or he will become angry. Yeah. And you will be destroyed in the midst of your activities for his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all who take refuge in him. Amen. So our king is coming. He's coming to his, to, you know, like we will be caught up with him, whether we've died or whether he comes and we're caught up with him. We will be with him when he comes to rule and reign. We'll be with him when he judges the nations. Again, scripture is very clear. When the nations come against Jerusalem, Deliverance for Jerusalem will come through the Lord. Um, there's, there are so many scriptures, I'm not going to go into them all. And you can read them, uh, diff the different prophets, Zechariah. So I was looking through Pastor Collins' The Truth, um, and I just found these verses which are, um, they're cross-referenced from what some of the verses we've been reading, uh, the, the, la the last, the minor prophets prophesied the coming of the king. They're cross-referenced with Revelation. And if you go into Revelation, they're cross-referenced with the Old Testament. So the Old Testament prophesied Jesus, would, uh, the Messiah, the king, would return and deliver them from their enemies. Revelation says the same, says the same thing. So in 1 Timothy 6.15, it says this. This is in the New Testament. At his appointed time, God will cause the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God is the blessed one, the only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And it says in Revelation 14, 14, and this is cross-referenced with, with, with Joel, we've just read. As I watched, I saw a white cloud. Sitting on the cloud was someone who looked like Jesus, the Son of Man. He had a golden crown on his head and held a sharp sickle in his hand. This is our king, Amen. the one who's coming right. with the sickle in his hand. Right. It says they will fight against the lamb and the lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. Amen. And those with him are called chosen and faithful. Amen. Revelation 19, I saw heaven opened and look a white horse. He who sat on it is called faithful and true. He judges justly and makes war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that he alone knows and he wears a robe that has been dipped in blood and he is called by the name, the Word of God. 
Revelation 19 again. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword with which to smite the nations. This doesn't sound like Jesus meek and mild, does it? This is hard. But this is the one who's coming. The one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. He will rule them with an iron scepter, which is what we heard way back in the beginning in Numbers. He's coming with a scepter to rule and reign. And on the cross, he ruled and reigned over the demonic, so we could be set free. But he's also coming to rule over the earth, the nations. And it says we'll be with him. He will tread the winepress that produces the wine of his anger, the wrath of God, the Almighty. Well, wasn't the wrath of God dealt with on the cross? For everyone who believes in him, that wrath has gone from our lives. But anyone who doesn't, Jew or Gentile, it's no different. We will face the wrath, wrath of God. The Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, a name is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And this is our King. We don't need to be afraid because we have him as our Lord and Saviour, if we have him as our Lord and Saviour, amen. We've asked him to be our Lord and Saviour. But this is the King who's coming. And it's important to know because I know as we've been spending time in, with this and listening to the stuff on Revelation, what it does is like, God, everyone needs to know. Everyone needs to know this is the King who's coming and he's coming soon. And it puts in me an urgency and a desire to, for people to know this, the church, yeah. <laughs> the church, but also those that don't, that don't know him. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, the shout of the king. You know, the shout of the king is amongst us. He's in us, who he is, this victorious one. We live in victory. But he's coming with his victory as well. And the shout of the king is in our midst. And it's interesting, if you think about us preparing the way of the Lord... Like John the Baptist, we're, preparing, we, we, we're saying, prepare the way of the Lord. He's coming. Whether he's coming to move in our lives or revival or whether he's com- you know, coming to the church or whether he's coming to the nations, whether he's coming as king of kings, whenever that is. We're, we prepare the way of the Lord yeah. in our lives, in our speak, in our, in, you know, speak, whatever. And that person is called a herald. Okay, so John the Baptist was a herald preparing the way of the Lord. And we can be a herald. Do you know what a herald is? I looked this up. A royal or official messenger, especially one representing a monarch in an ambassadorial capacity during wartime. A herald, a royal or official messenger especially one representing a monarch, our coming king, in an ambassadorial capacity during wartime. We can herald the coming of the king. We are meant to herald the coming of the king. His second coming, he's coming to be Lord of the nations and Lord of his church and Lord of the Jewish people when they turn to him. Shall we stand? Thank you, Jesus. Let's just close our eyes and just look to him. Lord, I know this is a a serious message in one sense. But Lord, you don't want this to be heavy. You just want us to know. You want us to know so that we know that we know that we know who you are to us as our Lord and Saviour and our our victory. Who you were, because it's important to know your word, your heart for Jew and Gentile. That we speak what you speak, Lord. We don't curse anybody. Lord, that we know who you are in your word. Your heart of mercy and love and faithfulness yes, Lord. ongoing. <laughs> we know we live in it. And Lord, we just, as a church and as individuals, Lord, just want to surrender to who you are, our King who is coming. 
our King who is majestic and holy, enthroned, mighty, worthy of all praise, worthy of all glory, worthy of all honour because of who you are and what you've done. We thank you, Lord, that you're coming with a kingdom that is going to be so glorious. We thank you. That's our hope. We thank you. This is what we have to look forward to. We thank you, Lord, that one day all this is going to this is going to end. Lord, with the tears, with the pain, with the suffering. Lord, we look forward to that day. We long to be with you, Jesus, to be in that place. But Lord, you're coming with that, but at the same time you will judge the living and the dead. You will rule and reign. As the word said, you always would. A star, a scepter will come to rule. And you will deal with our enemies. We thank you that you deal with our enemies spiritually. We thank you that you deal with enemy against us, you know, physical enemies, that you deal with them in our lives. But Lord, there are nations that are coming against, they're aligning against you, Lord. And Father, we pray for them. Give us a heart to pray for them, Lord Jesus. Lord, that they would turn to you and not away from you. They would turn to you, Lord. They wouldn't come against you, Lord, but they would turn to you, Lord. Give us that heart, your heart, for nations and individuals. Lord, because the time is short and you deserve all the glory. It's sin that you come to judge, Lord. It's those who are against you who make a decision, yeah. everyone's in the valley of decision, whether it's an individual or a nation in this day. And Lord, we ask for the spirit of prayer yes, yes. to come yes, Lord. and cause us to pray, yeah. cause us to be concerned, yes. cause us to carry your heart, Cause us to pray for the nations, to pray for the Jewish people that they would turn to you, that you would once again be their king. Lord, stir us as a church to prepare the way for you. Get our own hearts and lives right. And do whatever we can to help others get their hearts and lives right before you. That they will like us, come into your victory Amen. and your peace Amen. and the glorious, glorious presence of who you are, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that in this season we wouldn't just look forward to Christmas. Yes, we can use it to proclaim your coming. And Lord, our hearts will burn with your second coming. For others to know, yes. for others to know you, Jesus. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you that on different levels, people will be hearing things, maybe for the first time, and maybe a penny's going to drop. On different levels of who you are as King, yes. whether it's to themselves, to the Jews, yes. or to the nations, or that you're coming. But I thank you, Lord. Yes. Lord, none of this is a burden. That, Lord, it is revelation yeah. you want us to live in yeah. so we can live for you. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, Thank you, Holy Jesus. Spirit. Yeah. You lead us in this. Thank you lead us as a church yeah. to live for you in these yes. days, yes. proclaiming yes. your coming. Thank you, Thank you Jesus. Thank you.